Hello, this is Paul Atkins from Canvas Community in United Methodist Church down in uh, Little Rock on 7th Street, and you're listening to the Happy Hippie Jesus Show. Hey, Paul. You doing all right today? Yeah, sure. I'm doing all right. <laughs> so good. Well, before we dive into like, what you're doing here at Canvas, I've got a serious question for you. See, you're tall to the point that we call you Tall Paul, and I think very highly of myself. So from one elevated person to another, Will you set Bill straight about Jesus not being a hippie? I, I have absolutely nothing to speak to that about. I really don't. That's just no comment on Jesus' lack of hippiness. I there's so many ways you could go with that. I have no idea what you mean by hippie exactly, or what you want to read into or out of the, the scriptures about hippiness and Jesusness and so on. So uh, I'm I, I, I'm a, that's a win. I'm afraid I cannot uh, enter. You can claim a victory, but I, I've not tried to give you one intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Jeremy needs to get a win anywhere he yeah, can. Yeah, I mean, I understand that, that, that you should definitely take a win if you think you can claim one. You know, this is going to come out, I think, the 1st of January. So I'm going to say I'm up 1 to 0 in the new year. <laughs> 1 to 0 in the new year. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, what is Canvas Community and a little bit about what you do here? We've been trying to figure that out for years. So it's it's a church, but it's not a church. It's an extension of the church. It's a mission. It's, it's all of those things. I think we're officially organized as a mission congregation. Uh, but not one that would uh, ever grow up into being a, quote, real church so that we can always remain a little flexible in uh, how we respond to the needs of our community. We have a we have a mission really to folks who don't feel included, who have felt homeless either spiritually or literally physically and sometimes both. So that's like our Sunday night worship event is Largely the spiritually homeless who may have a home and a job and that kind of thing. Then our Wednesday afternoon thing, which we're, we're getting ready for today, uh, is, is largely our friends who are literally homeless, who also maybe obviously have spiritual needs just like everybody does. So that's, that's the big two areas and kind of how we tie them together. That homelessness can be spiritual and or physical. Jeremy often makes me feel like I'm not included. So could I benefit from the... Certainly. <laughs> you certainly could. I think you appreciate it as well. As long as you're willing to let Jeremy be included as well. That's the big challenge. Oh. Is that you can't... Your, your inclusion cannot come at somebody else's exclusion. So I don't know. Work that out within yourself, Bill. That sounds so Jesus. It really does. It really does. When you're ministering to the spiritually homeless as opposed to the literally homeless, is there a different uh, way you go about that? Or, or does it pretty much work just the same? I, I'm usually the one called upon to, to minister and deal directly with the physically homeless and sometimes but but I, I do try to that's a reminder to myself as well to just be patient with the folks who are spiritually homeless and may not see themselves as homeless necessarily may not see themselves as in need just like the people that we see who are clearly in need I mean, that's one of our challenges is that when you worship with people who live their lives in public eye, then they have crises in the public eye in the middle of worship. And they deal with things out in the open because they're not able to hide anything. They don't have a home to go to and scream at the wall or do whatever you do to cope with the fact that you're a broken human being. They have to cope with that fact right there in front of God and everyone, which makes everybody uncomfortable because that's why we like to have a place to go to hide so we can deal with our stuff in the privacy of our own home, put our happy face on and go out into the world. But people who are homeless literally don't have that privilege. So that's that I kind of draw that out so that we can humanize the folks that we see having this uncomfortable, unnerving crisis in front of us. So I don't know that I answer your question other than to say that they should be about the same, but, but there are some differences in how people deal with our common brokenness. 
How has working with people who are physically homeless shaped your views of Jesus? That's an excellent question. When you sit with people who are more like the, uh, the, the probable audience of Jesus' ministry, people who were lepers and outcasts in his day, and you sit with them and you open the scriptures with them, then you, you see it from a, a different perspective. And so you, you begin to notice things that you didn't notice before. Well, just a simple example that's kind of coming up, at least in real time. It'll have already happened by the time this podcast goes out. But, you know, on uh, the, the Lessons and Carols service, the, the, the climactic passage is from first chapter of John. And it says, the word came and dwelt with us. And the, the literal reading of that is pitched his tent with us. And while a tent, and this might have been really normal housing for the first century, depending on your tribe and, and situation, that says today that Jesus was pitching his tent with the people that are pitching tents out in the woods. And they were, he was setting up camp with us where we are at the bottom. That kind of perspective is, I guess, how I've changed the way I look at the scriptures and look at the Jesus that's in the scriptures. Well, here, I'm going to ask a different version of the same question. Sure. How did your views of Jesus lead you to make this your calling? The thing that really shaped how I got here was uh, in, in seminary. I was going to Memphis Theological Seminary. I was taking two courses at a time. And I was in this church history course that I thought was really not going anywhere. So I thought to myself, why don't I just ditch this one this time, come back to it later, and instead show up at the Manor House, which is uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. It's the living room for the homeless run by one of the Memphis Theological Seminary professors. And I would just volunteer there every Thursday morning, go to my Thursday afternoon class, and then go home. So it was kind of a, kind of a non-traditional, non-credit class that I just thought, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do this for a semester. Part of that experience was just seeing how normal people are, no matter where they come from, no matter how weird they seem to be on the outside, because we're all weird. I mean, y'all are experts at that. You know who's weird. You are. Um, I am. So, but but connecting with people, and we served a lot of coffee with a lot of sugar, and so I was getting some coffee and standing at the table, and uh, one of our guests walked up, and she said, hey, Paul, would you hand me the sugar? I said, sure, Jennifer, and I handed it, and I just realized in that instant of normalcy that I was just sitting around the coffee table with Jennifer, and she was there with me, and we were talking to each other as human beings. So that's kind of how I got to this place, that, that little opening of seeing people together as, as, as one people and not us and them. I'm really not answering the question again. You know, I'm not certain how my, my perspective on Jesus changed or shifted. I mean, I guess it's all a tap matter of taking the scriptures seriously as much as I could and, and being disturbed by it, trying not to run away. I guess that would be the short answer to that question. I noticed when we got here, one of your, I guess, friends came in to use the restroom. And what that reminded me of is how much trust has to be built up to do a ministry like this. And I know y'all intentionally work on that. So my question, I guess, is what intentionally do you guys do to try to build trust with the uh, population in downtown Little Rock? We try to learn names as best we can. I mean, I try to just be present as much as I can. I mean, that's one of the tensions that I have is being in charge of stuff is uh, not being able to just sit and talk to people as much as I would like. I guess being patient when people aren't immediately happy to see you or immediately trust you because their inability or unwillingness to trust other people has been earned in a in a very fair and reasonable fashion. Life has treated them very, very poorly. And and I don't even know all the details of everybody's situation, but you know, I, I trust that, that is that's where they come from, that life hasn't and other people haven't dealt with them fairly. So you just have to be patient and be consistent in how you relate to them, be as fair as possible over the, the long term so that people can see that 
eventually that you have integrity with how you treat them. That you know, it goes with for everything. I mean, with you have to ask them to leave for you know making the space unsafe through you know violence or you know language or or stealing or anything you know that is a violation of our, our community ethos then you have to be fair in doing that and consistent the best of your ability and also keep as much as is possible keep that that relationship open even though it's changed because you can't come in the house right now for a couple months or however long and that that's always a challenge because that's how you connect with people as you welcome them in if you can't welcome them in because you know they've you know, broken the that safe space that's essential for the whole enterprise, then you have to go out of your way a little bit to keep that relationship going. You mentioned learning their names, and I couldn't help but think of the sinful woman that comes and pours the expensive perfume on Jesus' head and the response of those sitting at the table with him of, does he not know she's a sinful woman? Does she not know she's a sinner? And what that passage has spoken to me for years is, in that moment, we see a woman that has lost her humanity with the table, but Jesus restores it. And learning names really for people that, let's be honest, are treated like they're not human and forgotten. Learning their names really does restore their humanity in some way, does it not? Sure. You know, every Wednesday we uh, have people sign in. We do that for uh, multiple reasons. One is to help me remember their names if they will write legibly and, or I can see them writing it as they come in so I can kind of jog my memory. Because I, I will ask people multiple times what their name is and they will get frustrated. That, and I'm so, oh, I'm so sorry, but I want to know your name and I my brain is deficient and I can't remember it. I know you know I'm Brother Paul. What is your name for the thousandth time? Maybe 1001 and I'll remember it. I'm unabashed about asking people their name over again, over again. Uh, but we also have them write them down so that I can have a chance to remember that. And also so we know, they know that we see them. I mean, it's not like we keep these lists at all. I mean, I just, somebody hands them to me at the end of the night and I go, that's wonderful. And I throw it and throw it away. It's not anything that we keep a log of. We keep track of how many people come through best we can, but we're not monitoring who's here. But that also does give them that accountability that you didn't just wander in and you're just not floating through. You're, you're here. We see you. And that is the beginning of the relationship and hope, you know, accountability and all those things that go along with relationships is that if you're just an anonymous person floating around, well, then you can avoid entanglements, but we try to softly entangle ourselves anyway. Can you give us a story of someone's life that's been transformed who is either physically homeless or spiritually homeless, how coming to Canvas has changed their life for the better. Two stories is fine as well. Two stories or is fine. Three. Or three. Uh, I'll, I'll just... Or we can go biblical and you do, can do seven. <laughs> <laughs> seven stories. The first story that came to mind is uh, a guy who didn't actually come here a whole lot, but he, he did come a little bit. He knew who we were, but he was uh, in the county jail. And I, he was in a pod at, at the jail with some other people that I knew better. And I was going to visit them and write them letters. And, and he tagged in to write me about cashing this check. He had won some civil lawsuit in Hot Springs and was awarded $362.47 or something like that. And he didn't know how to cash it in jail. Well, I, I didn't either. I don't know. I do now if, if anybody... If, any of your listeners needs to uh, needs to cash a check from somebody in jail. I know how to do that. But he started writing. I visited him, and we started adding him to our list of folks that we drop notes to every month. It, it used to be we tried to write several letters to each person and mail them separately, so they would all get lots of mail, get their name called multiple times at mail call. I, but it, there's there's about thirty now that we write to on a regular basis. And so it, it's just everybody writing on one card. But those notes made a big difference for him. Uh, he wrote that he felt like he was in a dark hole. He couldn't sleep enough, you know, to get rested. He was depressed. He was in this deep depression. And he said our, our letters were, our notes and, and words were, were like little, you know, the only mail he got that was not legal or 
had to do with court proceedings. And it, it actually had a personal connection. And that helped him believe that somebody else would care about him and that, that he was a significant enough person to care about himself. You know, he made a connection with one of our kids who started scribbling on there, you know, some little note as he learned to read in first grade, write in first grade, he'd scribble something in there. And that family and, and he connected, I would get them to, to pay for the, the summer care package that the prisons do and the winter care package that the prisons do. And when he got out, they sent a whole bunch of clothes and stuff. He wanted to move back to California, just kind of get away and back to where he liked to be. So when he got out last summer, I went to see him and wish him well, give him a hug, give him our stuff as he got on the bus to go to California. So I think our, in, in that instance, our connecting with him, even through simple letters to, to prison, made a difference to him. And it also made a difference to us. I mean, that helped shape this family's youngest son. They keep sticking around despite the insanity. And also he is trying to learn sign language to speak with one of our friends who's who's deaf. There's lots of connecting and learning how to connect with people that's going on there. That's the first story that came to mind. It strikes me that that wasn't anything overly complicated. It was a fairly simple act. And sometimes we make things harder than they are. And we think if I'm going to change the world and I've got to do this big dramatic thing, but Mm -hmm. we can change people's lives and we can change the world through simple things like mailing a card to someone that's in jail. That's true. Bill, I want more people to listen than just your family. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a contest to encourage people to rate us on iTunes. Wouldn't it just be my family rating us on iTunes? But then other people can see it and they'll help us expand and grow our show so more people can experience the idea of Jesus not being a hippie or being a hippie or whatever happens. Oh, so what we could do is we could ask people to take a screenshot of them rating us on iTunes or Apple Podcast, and then email it to the Happy Hippie Jesus Show at gmail.com. That's the Happy Hippie Jesus Show at gmail.com, and they could win something. Yeah, but we got to give them something worth winning. Oh, I got it. They could win their choice of either a T-shirt or coffee mug featuring either Jeremy the White Butterfly, the Happy Hippie Jesus, or even Bill the Happy Hippie Jesus Christmas Elf. Do you think anybody would really want that stuff? I don't know. It's worth a try. Let's go for it. Woohoo! Now back to the show. And I think the thing that I try to stress to people, it seems like what I'm asking is very simple, is to just show up and sit down and be with people. But I also believe that that is actually maybe harder than raising money to buy coats or collecting coats and giving them out or being in the kitchen and working really hard to make the meal. I mean, all those things are very busy, active things. And if you're just going to sit and talk to somebody that you may not think you have any connections with or may be uncomfortable with, that that is, I am actually asking something bigger and harder than to show up and, and spoon, you know, mashed potatoes onto a plate. But that is at the same time, that is the thing that is the most significant is to treat somebody with respect and concern uh, and friendship, even if you don't know them. We use the word friend a lot and we do that so that we will remember who, how we want to relate, but we also, because it's aspirational, we want to relate to them as friends. And we, at the same time though, know that we're not necessarily going to be friends in the same way that I'm friends with y'all. Just being present is at once the simplest and the most possibly difficult thing to do. Really listening to you so far, it doesn't sound like Canvas is really doing a homeless ministry as much as a compassion ministry. Yes, your friends are homeless in some sense of the word, whether it's spiritually or physically, but the work you're doing is about compassion with accountability and relationship. (laughs) That sounds accurate. If we were going to... It'd be good uh, um, Americans and just solve problems and fix stuff. Then, then we would just go and find housing, and that'd be all we would do. But I think there's there's more to it than that. I think there's a 
fracture in our uh, in our society, and it it's at once it's just bigger than getting jobs or getting a house. There's there's a healing that needs to happen in our world, and that's why I think it's important for people um, to cross these social boundaries that exist in our world in order for that healing to have a chance to happen. Unfortunately, just crossing the boundary doesn't mean that it's going to get healed. It could could actually make it worse. You know, it's like if you break a bone and and it just starts to heal after a while, and then you go back to the doctor and he says, that's growing back really screwball. We're going to have to break it again to set it properly. You know, that, that, that can happen, but that's the risk that you have to take if, if you're going to cross that boundary. That made me think of a uh, story with uh, Mother Teresa. The story goes that a reporter was interviewing Mother Teresa. He said, I've noticed that you are here feeding the hungry, but what are you doing to teach them to feed themselves? And Mother Teresa thought for a second and looked at him and said, you know, God called me to feed the hungry, not to teach them how to feed themselves. That's somebody else's call. Maybe that's your call to teach them how to feed themselves. No one ministry, no one person can solve all the problems. As Canvas community, what is it in this ministry that God is calling you guys to primarily? The, the first thing is to be present. That's, that's the main starting point. Uh, we're, you know, as we lean towards uh, forming this new nonprofit called Fuse, uh, and it's fused in the verb sense that, that things are fused together in terms of service providers like medical, mental health, provide, finding social services, connecting people to benefits they're eligible for, just the different so service providers, fusing them with our friends, fusing the service providers together in one space and in one coordinated effort. But in, in doing that... Uh, it's, I think it's going to be essential that we not lose that presence, that relationship, because that's that's the basis for anything else that might happen. And it's also important to find good partners, you know, because we can't do everything. And partners even beyond the the organization of Fuse that we that we put together, you know, there are people doing lots of other things around the city, and we're trying to make sure we. At least know who they are and they know who we are so we can work together. Sounds like you're creating partnerships. So you're not doing everything. You are empowering other entities to be able to do this while you maintain your relationship connections. I'd say the Bible is, is a story of a lot of things, but one of them is God meeting people where they are and asking them to come one step closer. You can disagree with that, but it's my podcast. So that's what we're going to use. <laughs> What's... I guess some ways that you can help that people from like churches can come one step closer to engaging with people that are physically homeless. And we'll go the other way. What's some ways that we can encourage people that are physically homeless to come one step closer to God or to the church? In your own context, figure out who that is that, I mean, it may be the homeless. It may not be. I mean, it may just be folks in a certain neighborhood that's very poor. But, but I guess the thing, the tricky part about it is to do it in an authentic way, to make some sort of connection in an authentic way that is that doesn't continue to communicate that we're the powerful ones who have stuff and we're going to give it to you. And we want you to kind of stay poor so we can continue to give you stuff and feel good about ourselves. I mean, one way to do that is to actually just is to eat with people. And I try to encourage people to do that on Wednesdays. We do that explicitly on Mondays when we have a thing called Dinner with Purpose. I mean, if you're close to Little Rock, you're welcome to come down and, and hang out with us and just see what, what goes on and try to be with people, especially on a Monday evening. Dinner with Purpose is explicitly so that the folks who are serving and the folks who are receiving all sit together and eat the same meal around the same table. And then we have a guided discussion around a particular life topic. And it's all over the map, just whatever. I'm usually a little TED talk or some sort of video clip, and then we just discuss around the table about that. And that but something along those lines, where where you're you're connecting with people that you don't normally connect with, and you'll just have to be creative in your own context to figure out the simple, natural way to do that. And I mean, I said simple and natural, but that 
it's going to require some some unnaturalness because if it was so natural, you'd be doing it already. And as far as the folks who are homeless to to go one step closer to God, I think I guess I, I can't really put the burden on them as much. I guess for me, it would be to to be able to sit with them long enough to have some conversations where whatever's bugging them, whatever's gone wrong with them, that they can sort of say it out loud or, or let it let it be what it is and not try to run from it. I mean, it's, that's the same advice that I would give myself. You know, any anything that is is bugging you or, you know, sinful in your life or broken in your life, to let it be what it is and to know that God loves you no matter what that is, that you don't have to run away from it, whitewash it, throw it away, push it away, that it can sit there and God can sit there with you in it. And that could be kind of a starting point for transforming it into something more along the lines of what God has in mind for all of us. Jesus constantly went to the outcast until they knew that he was trustworthy enough to come to. And that's and it's all about relationship. It's about building relationship. And those of us on the inside, it's on us to welcome those on the outside. I'm going to do a hard transition here. What are some myths about homelessness that you would love to dispel? Well, I mean, I guess I could answer the question, why don't they just get a job? Some of the whys would be lack of education and training, that our educational system has failed many of them. Also, the the lack of housing means that if you do secure a job of some sort, that's just one hurdle, you know, convincing somebody that you're hireable and getting them to hire you. There's much more that you have to overcome every day that you go to the job. You have to be clean. You have to have clothes clean. You have to have transportation. And there's just a thousand different hurdles that keep you from keeping a job if you get one. Other myths to be dispelled, you know, they're all dangerous or mentally ill. I mean, there's a lot of mental illness. There's a lot of addiction. It's not always a cause and effect kind of thing. I guess the, to, to, to the big myth is that it's a simple thing, maybe, to solve. And every person has different hurdles, different barriers. It's not unlike starting a new workout routine at the beginning of the year. This would be the beginning of the year when some of us have attempted to, to keep a New Year's resolution. I mean, I guess what, it, what happens is, is our brains are wired in certain ways and we reinforce that wiring that, that forms habits and character. And then changing that, if we want to, becomes just a, a Herculean task to unwire your brain the way it is now and rewire it in a new way. Maybe already you've, you've, your listeners have, have dropped their New Year's resolution to get more exercise or to eat better, you know, all of, and so what, what happens is people are homeless. If they don't find a way out within, you know, three to six months, then something changes in their brain, I think. I mean, I, I don't have, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't have any long, you know, long-term research on this, but you get into a fight or flight scenario 24 seven that alters the way you behave for survival purposes. You have to think about, okay, where's the next meal in a couple hours? Where am I going to sleep? You know, and not where am I going to use the bathroom? And so the, that tyranny of the urgent takes over your life and making a long-term plan, even a week, like I'm going to be there next Tuesday for an appointment. That becomes a, a very difficult task just because the way you've had to survive as as a homeless person or as a person experiencing homelessness as we kind of wrap up and wind down here what's next for canvas community uh anything that you want to plug and how can people connect with you if they want to get involved or you can connect with us uh through the canvas community facebook page or my facebook page or email which you all can Throw out there. Paul, don't worry. Bill's learned how to make show notes, so he'll link all that in. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, also, Gail Brooks is our lead pastor. I'm the, I'm the deacon and the uh, associate pastor. Gail is our lead pastor since uh, July 1. So you can 
connect with her if that's easier to do. My tallness and deep voice is too intimidating. You can talk to Gail. She's, she's, she's nice. She's the opposite. <laughs> so you're welcome to come down on a Wednesday. We open at 3.30 and uh, hang out with us, play games. We've got Jenga, which requires nobody to have a massive amount of strategery involved. It's just fun to play. There's Monday nights. You can adopt any of those nights. Your churches can do that. That that would be the way to connect going forward. I mean, I mentioned Fuse that we're we're working towards laying the groundwork for that and hopefully transforming a little bit of this building in the next year or so. So maybe when you when you show up, it'll, it'll look a lot different from what it does now. If it's your first time, then it doesn't matter, does it? No, <laughs> it doesn't. All right, thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. You bet. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it.